Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is the Lord our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth stand in awe of him. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, and with righteousness to judge the world, and the peoples with his truth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The psalm appointed for the morning of the fourth Sunday in Advent is Psalm 80, found on page 441. Hear, O thou shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, show thyself also, thou that sittest upon the cherubim. Before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up thy strength and come and help us. Turn us again, O God, show the light of thy countenance, and we shall be whole. O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry with thy people that prayeth? Thou feedest them with the bread of tears, and givest them plenteousness of tears to drink. Thou hast made us a very strife unto our neighbors, and our enemies laugh us to scorn. Turn us again, thou God of hosts, show the light of thy countenance, and we shall be whole. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt, thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou madest room for it, and when it had taken root, it filled the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it, and the boughs thereof were like the goodly cedar trees. She stretched out her branches unto the sea, and her boughs unto the river. Why hast thou then broken down her hedge, that all they that go by pluck off her grapes? The wild boar out of the wood doth root it up, and the wild beasts of the field devour it. Turn thee again, thou God of hosts, look down from heaven, Behold and visit this vine, and the place of the vineyard that thy right hand hath planted, and the branch that thou madest so strong for thyself. It is burnt with fire and cut down, and they shall perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, and upon the son of man whom thou madest so strong for thine own self. And so will not we go back from thee. O let us live and we shall call upon thy name. Turn us again, O God, Lord God of hosts. Show the light of thy countenance, and we shall be whole. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The epistles written in the fourth chapter of the epistle of St. Paul to the Philippians, beginning at the fourth verse. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be, be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Here endeth the epistle. Blessed art thou, O Lord God of our fathers, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou for the name of thy majesty, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou in the temple of thy holiness, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou that beholdest the depths and dwellest between the cherubim, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou on the glorious throne of thy kingdom, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou in the firmament of heaven, praised and exalted above all forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, 
as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Holy Gospel is written in the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, beginning at the 19th verse. This is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? He confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, Art what then art thou Elijah? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees, and they asked him, and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elijah, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabar beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Praise be to thee, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In our Christmas reflections, we are often reminded to think on how Jesus, the Son of God, came in great humility, being born in a lowly manger, attended by shepherds. This humble first coming, of course, gives us hope as we remember that his return will be in power and glory. This morning, we are reminded of another way in which Jesus' first advent was a modest one, and what it means for us today. The arrival of a king in the ancient Near East was usually accompanied by an official herald who went before him, announcing the king's arrival and making sure everything and every one was ready for the presence of their liege. As the king of kings, Jesus obviously deserved the greatest of announcements, trumpeters, fanfare, the miraculous return of heroes to go before him. But instead, God chose to raise up one man, an ascetic living in the desert and dressed in camel's hair to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Like so many things in the life of Jesus, his manger birth, riding to Jerusalem on a donkey, fishermen for followers. Jesus' herald, John the Baptist, was simple and humble in appearance, but incredibly powerful when fulfilling God's plan. John the Baptist performed no signs or miracles. He preached fiery sermons we might today call seeker-hostile, and he refused to socialize in the common ways of the time. And yet, the Bible says, the crowds continually went out to see him. They repented and were baptized, and John's followers were loyal to him even after he was imprisoned. Those he baptized apparently went on to baptize others, as far off as Ephesus, even King Herod, who would eventually have him killed, gladly listened to John speak. Who was this man? He was clearly causing quite a stir, and there were those who were wondering if perhaps he was the Messiah. So as our gospel lesson recounts this morning, the Pharisees sent Levites and priests to question John. An interesting choice, since John's father was also a temple priest. Aware of what others had begun to think of him, John confessed that he was not the Messiah. St. John, the Gospel writer, makes it clear in this episode, as he had in the first chapter, that John the Baptist was not the light of the world, but came to bear witness to that light. Unsatisfied that John could just be some guy performing baptisms in the desert, they ask him, Are you Elijah, or are you that prophet? By that prophet, they meant the next Moses, because God promised way back in the book of Deuteronomy that I will raise up for them a prophet like you, Moses, from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. But after Ju Moses dies in chapter 34, the authors write, And there has not risen a prophet since in Israel, like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. So the next Moses will have the words of God and will tell the people everything God wants them to know. And also, the next Moses will know the Lord like Moses did face to face. John the Baptist says, no, this isn't me. The Levites also ask him if he's Elijah, 
You see, the Jews were waiting for the return of Elijah. In the book of Malachi, the prophecy reads, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Elijah's return was a sign God was coming back to dwell with his people again. Where had the Lord gone? The biblical prophets make it clear that the exile Israel had suffered at the hands of Babylon and other nations would continue, even now that they had returned to Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple all because of their sins. But Malachi says God will return, the exile of pagan oppression would end, and there would be forgiveness of sins. Even today, Jews still wait for Elijah's return. This is signified in the cedar meal at Passover. They open their door for Elijah, pour him a cup, and leave a seat open for the prophet to be with him. Elijah's cup is poured, but not enjoyed representing that final redemptive act of God that Jews are still looking for to enjoying. The coming of the Messianic Age. How significant it is then for those of us in Jesus who can partake of the cup each week. The cup, Jesus said, was the start of a new covenant of which he is prophet and priest. The Jews standing in front of John the Baptist there in Bethany believed Elijah's return would be a bodily return and would be the heralding of the Messiah, whose ministry would mean reconciliation, the end of oppression and exile. But remember from Malachi, it also meant God's glory returned to the temple. And here's John, not in the temple, but way out here in the wilderness. Did they really think John could be Elijah? To be fair, there was something Elijah ish about John. The way he dressed, his teaching in the wilderness, his hanging out near the Jordan where Elijah had been taken up into heaven. Like Elijah, John made an enemy of an evil king and his wife. And of course, he also called for repentance. But John denies that he is Elijah miraculously returned. Before his birth, though, an angel had declared to his father Zechariah that John would go in the power and spirit of Elijah to prepare the people. In last week's gospel, we heard Jesus confirm all of this to his followers. So now imagine the puzzlement of these Levites the Pharisees had sent to investigate John. He's not claiming to be the Messiah, which I guess means we can't stone him, and he doesn't claim to be a prophet like Moses or Elijah. They didn't know what to make of him, and the Pharisees still don't know what to say when Jesus later asks them if John's baptism was of God or man. The only thing John will say about himself to the Pharisees are the words of a different prophet, Isaiah. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The message of all these prophets, Elijah, Isaiah, Malachi, John the Baptist, is similar. God will return to dwell with his people and make things right. But the issue is not the timing, but the preparation God's people should undergo. The message and testimony of John the Baptist was not about himself, as Jesus's would rightly be, but a call for repentance in preparation for the glory of the Lord, the true messenger of the covenant mentioned in Malachi, the Messiah. Here's one final observation on who John the Baptist was. It has to do with his relationship to the temple priesthood and what this foreshadowed for Christ's church and ministry. Remember that John was descended from Aaron, the first priest, and his father, Zechariah, was a temple priest. We might wonder, why wasn't John teaching and working in the temple, taking on the family business, as it were? After all, he was performing baptisms, a ritual cleansing for sins, while calling the pious to repentance. This is what a devout Jew would have or should have sought out by visiting the temple. 
But the Spirit of God calls John out of the city, away from the temple and its many problems. There in the wilderness, John performs his ministry away from what was supposed to be the center of religious life and devotion. It is there that as Jesus later confirmed to his disciples, the law and prophets ended and the gospel of the kingdom began to be preached. It was Levites, temple servants, who came out to ask John if he is Elijah returned. As I read earlier, the prophecy of Elijah's return is found in Malachi, a small prophetic book concerned mainly with prophecies against the disgraced priesthood and problems with temple practice. During Jesus' ministry, our Lord spoke often on this very same topic, pointing out the many ways the Jewish leaders had fallen short while prophesying about the temple's destruction. It was only a matter of time before the temple would be destroyed. But Christ's church had not yet truly begun. So here John the Baptist serves in the middle between the two. He was the last prophet. But unlike the others, he saw Jesus face to face. And when John the Baptist looks up and sees Jesus, make no mistake about it, the words he says to his disciples are temple words a priestly declaration. They are the same words used in the Mass today when our priest presents the body and blood of Jesus to his church. When the bread and the cup are lifted up, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Look, the one who is to be sacrificed has arrived. The ultimate fulfillment of the priesthood, the new temple through whom we have the forgiveness of sins and God dwells with us again. The end of our exile has finally come. Brothers and sisters, as we end this season of Advent, let us remember the prophetic call of this humble herald to make ready the way of the Lord, preparing our own hearts through continual repentance, raising up every valley, and lowering every hill in our lives. Let us find those things in our lives that, as John said about himself and his own reputation and identity, must diminish that Christ might increase in us as we wait in joyous anticipation of our Lord's second coming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our forefathers and to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath which he sware to our forefather Abraham that he would give us, that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, 
forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O God, make clean our hearts within us and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. O Lord, raise up, we pray thee, thy power and come among us and with great might succor us that whereas through our sins and wickedness we are sore let and hindered in running the race that is set before us, thy bountiful grace and mercy may speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put upon us the armor of light, now in the time of this mortal life in which thy Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty, to judge both the quick and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal, through him who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, now and ever. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, Defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by thy governance, may be righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Governor, whose glory is in all the world, we commend this nation to thy merciful care, that being guided by thy providence, we may dwell secure in thy peace. Grant to the President of the United States, and to all in authority, wisdom and strength to know and to do thy will. Fill them with a love of truth and righteousness, and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve this people in thy fear. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee, and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops and other clergy, and upon the congregations committed to their charge, the healthful spirit of thy grace. And that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of men, that thou wouldest be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially we pray for thy holy church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, that it may please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we then unworthy servants do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. For the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant the requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, 
as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you.